Welcome everybody to the 40 Finance channel. Got a little live stream going on just in my camera. Get that window out of there. Um, hopefully everybody's doing good. Pretty interesting week in the stock market. We're kicking off earnings. Uh, we've had some interesting ups and downs throughout the week. Uh, nothing particularly groundbreaking. I mean, I think Coinbase was the biggest story uh, that I can remember. I'm sure that there was a couple others that I'm overlooking. Uh, but yeah, so I thought I'd hop on on Friday, uh, starting with the seed question, are stocks overvalued right now? Um, and I'll dig into a couple examples. I've really struggled with this one lately because of uh, the potential for the future earnings for corporations. So um, trying to understand where stocks are today versus the reopening over the summer, which we've already started on. Also factoring in that from an international standpoint, we are still uh, way behind on reopening and vaccination. So it's not an easy question, are stocks overvalued? Um, I think that you really have to stare at the ones that you're thinking about buying. And I'm trying to check the chat board to make sure that that's, that's always something that's hit or miss. But I think you have to really project beyond what analysts are projecting in revenue. I think you have to think about it on your own front. Uh, Tom Brady, I appreciate you commenting because I was just trying to figure out if it was working or not. So thank you. Um, but so where I'm going with this is obviously trailing PE is basically worthless right now. It's the same as it has been for the past 12 to 15 months, right? But we do have forward PE uh, that helps quite a bit. And forward PE oftentimes banks on analyst projections for earnings per share. Uh, so that's all fairly straightforward. And you guys know that I'm a big fan of looking at analyst projections for EPS and revenue uh, over the next uh, 12 months or so. And I'm always looking at that information and the trends and, and whatnot to see where things are landing. Uh, so, but those people, analysts, are, you know, they're, they, they spend more time on it than the average Joe or the average me. Uh, however, there, some of these uh, companies are not going to hit uh, those earnings projections. Some of them are going to go over these earnings projections that analysts have in place, just like they did every single year prior to the pandemic, right? Uh, projections are guesstimates, but I think that this year in particular, the guesstimates are, are very much guesstimates. So when you think about uh, perhaps Disney would be a good example uh, with parks reopened now and uh, the assumption that they will continue to operate. That was a big revenue stream for Disney formerly. Uh, their biggest of the three revenue streams. Now streaming has uh, supplanted that. I think streaming has now become the top one. Uh, however, getting Disney's park revenue back anywhere uh, prior to what it was, anywhere close to that number, even if it's uh, 65, 70%, is a huge boost to Disney uh, in terms of earnings per share and revenue. So this is what makes it hard with overvaluing on the stock front uh, where you have to think a little bit deeper. And I would say that if there is overvaluation, it's in stocks that you can't necessarily uh, track their metrics, that it becomes a lot harder. And I have a couple of those names, uh, most notably Unity Software which would be a build into the future or a build uh, not so far into the future, but perhaps two to three years. Uh, it looks good on paper, but there's very little in the fundamentals that support uh, Unity's uh, share price, which is about $99 today. And then you look at some other ones 
that are, are coming back to uh, Earth, so to speak, that have dipped a little bit, let's just say Teladoc, uh, to pick one. Um, there's one where the earnings are starting to catch up with the valuation. So I am going to transition to Yahoo and let's just take, I actually, this is a little nerve wracking because I haven't looked at Teladoc in a while. Um, but let's see what we got. So long story short on Teladoc, from a fundamental standpoint as it stands today, the company is not profitable, right? We know they had a good year with the things that happened in the pandemic. They reached a high of almost $300. Now we're down to $191. Uh, so you might think to yourself, well, that dropped $100. Does it, you know, is this stock on sale, so to speak? But from an analyst perspective, let's see what that shows us. And you have uh, minus $5 last year, projection of minus, you know, call it $2 this year to minus $1 next year. That's just on EPS. This is a young company. So let's take into account uh, revenue, right? Uh, from a price to sales perspective. Year ago was one billion. This year, two billion. Next year, two point six billion. As far as uh, estimates go, now that is solid. Certainly, this one's super solid at eighty one percent. But then you have a slowing, albeit very good, growth rate of plus thirty. Right, so things can't double infinitely into time uh, normally. Uh, so this is what makes it a little bit hard for Teladoc. And I guess you know you could go price to sales. This is quarterly view. I don't know how long they've been around. Uh, well, they have multiple years on the books. So last year, in excuse me, two years ago. About eleven forty-eight on price to sales. Last year at its this is twelve thirty-one, so it was probably running into the twenties or thirties on price to sales. Now you're down to fifteen. Fifteen is high compared to a long time ago, but the use model has certainly changed for Teladoc in the pandemic. And so, if I was just going on price to sales. It's also good to see a very low price to book. Um, I would say that, yeah, compared to last year, Teladoc is on sale. Now, there's the X factor, though, of all these numbers, right? Let's just skip to sales again. 2.6 billion is the estimate next year. Like, how realistic is it? You know, how much do you believe in these analysts? It's a, it's, a, it's a weird product, right? It's not, no one mandates it. You don't have to use it. It's not water. It's not oxygen. Um, so does the world continue to grow in Teladoc, uh, you know, environment? Or do things go back to the way they were and perhaps more competition comes out or something like that? Or uh, I've always said that uh, why in the heck isn't Zoom doing uh, whatever Teladoc's doing, <laughs> right? So like there's so many X factors that I think it is hard to really put your finger on things with the valuation right now. And I that's really settled in for me over the past couple weeks. I haven't been buying, I don't think I've bought a stock over the past two weeks, perhaps not even in April, I can't remember. Uh, however, it's, it's because I'm struggling to identify some of the trends that the growth stocks will have, uh, for me personally. Uh, and Teladoc was one example. I'm not, I'm not gonna buy Teladoc, I'm not particularly interested in that one. Uh, however, it's an intriguing use case. And so when I think about the stocks that I'm most comfortable with right now, uh, despite their valuation, is ones that, you know, that the, the upside is not quite here yet. Um, so Visa would be one right now. I literally don't care what Visa does. 
on a day-to-day -day basis. We know that credit card transactions are gonna go through the roof. Uh, it's just a matter of time. I mean, it would, it would be in a, a big rollback in the pandemic to stop Visa at this point. Uh, so that's one that I feel good about. Then you got, uh, then you have companies like Square and uh, PayPal. Between the two, I feel a little bit better about PayPal only because I think that they win off of um, credit card transactions as well to some degree. And I think me personally, I think the e-commerce uh, downtrend that's suspected for the summer, I think that's overblown. I think that people's habits have changed uh, with e-commerce. And if anything else, my sort of look at it is uh, you know, it, when we're out and about after the pandemic, there's probably more reason to shop online so that we can go enjoy things that really matter as opposed to sitting in a shopping mall, uh, for example. So just some interesting thoughts, and I'm happy to go through some of your stocks uh, ideas to share, you know, what, what do I think is overvalued. I'll look at... Um, my portfolio here real quick, just to tell you what's overvalued, what I see as overvalued in my own world, right? So pay safe, I would see as undervalued, uh, simply because of the growing use case for sports gambling. Now, I don't know what will happen to pay safe this year. It, it rolled back after the... Um, the IPO, or not the IPO, but after the SPAC changed over. So I see this one as undervalued. I would potentially add more with the understanding of it's a three to five year play, just like DraftKings. Magnite, which is uh, basically a tie into digital advertising. Um, I'll call this one flat. I'm still looking, I'm at 44.78, so I'm down. Uh, I'm still looking to get under uh, my personal cost basis into the 30s. So I'm letting this one hang a little bit. I do think Q3 and Q4 for Magnite is going to be great. Palantir, 2251, I would say is fair price. I'm in it for the long haul. So I am looking to purchase it, uh, as close as I can get to $20. Unity, overvalued. Um, and I will add more if we ever see another dip into the 80s. Sabre at 15, probably fairly valued for the immediate. However, I do think that Sabre has significant upside uh, into Q3 and Q4 and will eventually be a $20 stock. But for where the world is right now, I'll give Sabre slightly overvalued to fair price. End phase at 149, fair price. Square at 255 overvalued. And I bought some at 216. I don't know what in the hell happened that Square went up to like 280 or something this week. I don't get it. Uh, Amazon at 33.98. Um, I don't know. Fair value. Okay. I think that you try to get it below here, but I also think that it could be $4,000 by the end of the year. Etsy 219. Probably a shade overvalued. This will be the most interesting earnings uh, coming up. Smile Direct, undervalued with the understanding of a one-year hold. Taiwan Semi, undervalued considering the chip shortage and, and what will likely occur at this company. PayPal, probably overvalued at 270. Um, I am not buying anymore. It's a big part of my holdings. If I were to buy PayPal, I would try to get 235 to 250 if possible. Rocket, undervalued. Housing, dude, housing is going to crush it this year from a transactional value standpoint. Now interest rates are dropping again. Rocket, undervalued for a long-term hold. Visa, fair value, probably still some time to get in, but you you're, uh, have to commit to a one-year hold. DraftKings, uh, if you can commit to a two-year hold, this price might be fair. 
I think in the, if there's another market dip, we saw some weakness. I think that could get into the 40s, maybe 49, slightly below. Then you would buy in for long. Tap, which is uh, domestic beer, uh, probably fair value. Um, they're going to have a big rebound with concerts and, and baseball games and stuff coming back in. TJX, fair value, and Bitcoin, which, you know, who knows what that value is. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's my take on stocks over undervalued. I think you really have to stare at them because prices are inflated. And I think you have to understand that the momentum game, that I didn't do much of the momentum game last year, and a lot of people made a lot of money off of that, which is kudos to them. And hopefully, you know, you did too. I think the momentum game is over temporarily. Um, you might see momentum plays of 10%, but you're not going to get this like crazy bull case for Zoom out of, out of left field, right? Uh, you know, Zoom, the world went dark. People are like, Zoom's going to be the next thing. Uh, they certainly grew their business substantially. That thing appeared out of nowhere. I don't know if momentum plays like that are going to show up as much this year. Uh, but, you know, there's always one or two that do, right? Uh, I would not, um, you know, something like Coinbase with all the hoopla, I don't think that that is a strong momentum play only because of the hype. Anything that comes in on hype, you have to be careful because it's already escalated. Zoom went from zero to something. It wasn't, I mean, it turned out to be a hype stock, but it started from meager foundation, right? Coinbase is coming in hot, and I just don't know what's left in the short term for that. Uh, if you buy in, I would expect to hold long term would be my two cents. All right, so that's my take. I'm going to take a look at some of the comments. Let me grab a drink real quick. And Tom Brady, always good to see you. Um, that reopening plays are, are very overvalued. I, I kind of agree with that, particularly if you're talking about airlines, um, potentially Disney or things like it. I think hotels, um, those are also starting to get pushed a little bit. And, you know, I have some interest in Airbnb to maybe one day own that stock. Uh, I think it's, it's overvalued as well. Uh, it could be one of those things that you buy for five years and it'll pan out. Same with hotels and whatever. But I don't think that there's any secrets on reopening plays that are left uh, on the market right now. If you buy into reopening to make money, then just know that you have to hold it for longer. All right, Anthony asks for ADSK, which I don't know off the top of my head. Autodesk, I think that this was, uh, oh, maybe I don't know this one. All right, Autodesk, uh, big market cap, 65 billion. Looks like it reached a peak at 319 over in January of 21. Now you're at 294. P ratio of 55, EPS of $5, no dividend, has hit all of its earnings. The last four have all been good. Always look at the revenue to earnings chart for stocks I'm not super familiar with. And this is exactly what you want to see out of a company, which is growing the green bar and making sure that the blue bar is making the same amount of progress. And in this case, at least in 2021 fiscal year, it certainly uh, does look that way. Autodesk provides 3D design, engineering, and entertainment software. The company offers AutoCAD, uh, surveying, design analysis, da 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 da, construction management. Okay, so software company which is good because that means recurring revenues. Let's see what the analysts are saying. All right, last year EPS 405, this year 
uh, about five dollars. Next year, six eighty-seven. So quite a jump next year. I don't know what they're doing next year, but um, thirteen percent this year, eighteen percent next year on revenue, and we are talking billions of dollars. So that's exciting. Um, yeah, I mean, first pass. It looks uh, decent. I'll take a peek at tip ranks. Strong buy. We'll go with the fresh guys, which is going to be like two months ago and up. And you've got 342. A lot of uh, low threes, you know, low to mid threes. Um, so I don't know. It seems like analysts like this one. And um, I don't know the whole uh, deal behind Autodesk as far as how good their software is and, and stuff like that. I'm sure you can find out more in an earnings report. But uh, just for a stock that you're throwing out there, I think that it looks pretty decent. I wouldn't say that it's cheap. However, it does look, let me put this up. It does look like on a historical valuation that it is relatively cheap compared to, eh, not so much on the forward PE, um, it's a little bit more expensive than what we've seen in the past, but not too bad. So maybe a dip um, would be the best time to get in. It looks like you just had a dip. This would have been nice here, 260 or something, just to shave a couple bucks off. But overall, it looks pretty solid. So Autodesk, pretty solid stock. Thanks for suggesting it. All right. Thoughts on Wish? I love, ooh, do I, do I know Wish? I think I did this one lately. Yeah, okay. I did this on a video. I, I do sort of like this company. Um, this is an app. Let me just make sure that this is exactly what I think it is. Yep, okay. So this is an app. I know the screen's sort of messed up. You can't see the full thing. Wish is an app. And what's interesting, if you dig into it, it's marketed to um, young and less affluent audiences, if you will. So it has a lot of inexpensive items, imitation type items, stuff like that, um, because the whole point is low price point. Uh, so I did, this was in one of my videos, maybe under $20, and since I just see this price here. And I like the concept. Now you were at a high in February of 29. Now you're down to 12. Um, revenue, we'll go through the same rigmarole here. Uh, revenue up substantially. Earnings took a loss here. You'd have to investigate that a little bit. Um, I like that it is e-commerce. I like that it's an app form. Let's see what we've got. So last year, this, so this looks pretty good. Last year, minus $6, minus $5.87, right? This year, knocking on the door of profitability, minus 47 cents and then potentially hitting flat to minus 16 cents in 2022. Um, revenue wise, two and a half billion to, where's the average? 3.3 billion to four, to four billion. So you're plus 20% growth rate in both years. You know, at $12, um, I would, the only thing I would, uh, say is just make sure that you're checking the reviews of the website on the app store and stuff. Um, but let's see what TipRank says. But just make sure it's not like scamming people and losing a lot of users, stuff like that. But I like it. I like where it plays. Uh, one month ago on up, we've got 20, 22, 20, 31, 30, 25. So, hey, I mean, at 1235, even if you got to 20, you're at a 62% uh, upside there. I like it as an inexpensive play. 
Um, I think you do the best if you hold it through fiscal 2022. But again, I'm, I don't know why that downturn is continuing, the downturn to $13. It's good news. Just make sure it's not like the CEO quit or the app you know, exploded and everybody's mad about it. Assuming customers are still liking it for the reasons they liked it last year, then um, hey, it doesn't look like a bad play at all. It's certainly one that I would consider. Uh, Pickle Rick, Fiserv. I like Fiserv. I, it's kind of odd that I don't own this one, but I'm so anti-bank. Um, bank stocks in general. Fiserv, if you guys don't know, they they help banks in this new fintech world. So they help them achieve a lot of the fintech services such as online deposits, um, transfers of dollars. It's a company that's been, uh, yeah, it's been in business for a long time. Um, in this past year, Rocky Road uh, obviously, because bank branches and whatnot saw dramatic declines in volume. It's now eking up to 125. P ratio for Fiserv, this is pretty high, but we'll, we'll look into that. So that, that's the first thing. It could be a forward PE situation, though. They may have had a bad year last year. Um, they met, their, met or exceeded the last four earnings. And yeah, you can see like you wish this blue bar would grow a little bit more with the green bar, but I do believe they did an acquisition a year or two ago. Fiserv provides payment, financial services technology, uh, fintech payment segments. I was hoping it would do a good um, one-liner for us, but this is pretty long. Just assume, guys, that they, they help old school brick and mortar stock, uh, stocks, banks, uh, get online with some of the new fintech technology. Analyst perspective, 442 last year, adding a dollar to that, basically adding another dollar next year. R sales growth, so a little light, single digit sales growth, Third, uh, call it 14 billion to 15 to 16. So under 10%, I usually like to see double digits on stocks that I haven't uh, invested in yet, but that's just me. Uh, okay, let's take a look at tip ranks here, because these are going to be the guys that uh, study Fiserv day in and day out. Start one month ago, you got all buys, approximately 143 Call it 140. You're at 125 today. Does it have a dividend? It doesn't have a dividend right now. It may still be on. If it did, it may still be on suspension from um, the pandemic. I will honestly say, when presented with Fiserv, I think that it's a solid company and it has uh, being able to help brick and mortar banks over the long term is going to be a solid business. I would rather invest my money in uh, more of a fintech play like PayPal, uh, Square, some of the other names that are out there, but not a bad stock. Look at Clover today might be the next big squeeze. I've noticed that good old Chamath has not um, been around, <laughs> surprisingly with uh, you know the downfall of Clover stock. I think he took a lot of heat for that. So JP saying short squeeze. This one peaked in December. Chamath had a great Christmas and then it just tanked. Um, there's no fundamentals here. Earnings are looking good though. Let's uh, just out of curiosity because JP was talking about shorts. A uh, short percentage of float is not available. That's weird. Uh, share short is 38 million. The float is 107 million. So call it, you know, 35% or something like that is uh, share short. 
Um, I don't know if there's enough here to say short squeeze uh, at that level. Let's check the other site. Um, this high short interest site. Where does Clover trade on? NASDAQ. Okay. So NASDAQ. Let's see if they show up on this list. This list ends at 20%. I don't see them on here. Maybe they're under low float. That doesn't sound right. No, I don't know. I'll do a search just to make sure I'm not missing anything. Clove. Oh, there it is. Oh, that's Clovis, not Clover. Yeah. Anyhow, the, the point being, it's not showing up on some of the high short interest boards. Doesn't mean it can't be a short squeeze. Um, just out of curiosity and tip ranks. I'm not sure if anybody's going to cover this stock. Uh, well, you got a couple. One month ago, buy for 13, hold for 10, buy for 15. So, um, you know, on the, on the high upside there, this one was 732 when it opened this morning. If it did get to 15, then you've doubled your money. Uh, so maybe not a bad play. I don't know enough about it. Uh, but it is really taking a beating. And I just know that I haven't seen Chamath in like three months. So I assume that the beating is continuing. All right. Who do we got here? Hazaya, my top holdings I'm fine with because they still have a bright future. I don't think Zoom has that. Yep. NVIDIA, PayPal, Microsoft all have great outlook. I agree with that. Um, so those are three examples of, of many companies that I think you have to right now with inflation, with crazy stocks, I think you just have to say, can my company keep growing at least double digits for the next five years? And um, while Microsoft probably is in double digits over the next five years, you throw in their dividend and you know some of their software and server technology and they're you know i think that's pretty safe uh to say uh lsbr my favorite small cap right now it'll be one that i own i have to eyeball it here um pay safes there i do like uh, it would either be between Paysafe, Magnite, who else am I missing? If you want to count S Smile Direct, um, I think out of the names I just mentioned, Smile Direct probably has the closest thing to recent upside, uh, but it won't be until around uh, Q4. May it might be in January or February when Q4 reports. They've really been stuck in this $10 uh, mud puddle for a while, but it's okay with me. My one year, for tax purposes, my one year with Smile Direct doesn't come up until I think August, uh, potentially September. So um, after September, I'm free to sell at the long-term capital gains rate, um, and I'll wait for the right opportunity there. I'd like to double my investment in that one. All right. JP skills. I'm watching skills, JP. I'm with you. Uh, it's been interesting that that one has fallen off of a bridge as well. Let's see where we're at today. Put it up here for fun. This was a SPAC that came out hot and heavy, uh, as hot as $42. Um, it is in gaming, mobile gambling. Uh, biggest claim to fame is that they're working with the NFL, helping them to develop things. I do have an eye on this one as well. I just think um, it's hard to get excited right here. I, I keep waiting for it to go lower. Uh, I have to go into their most recent earnings report. The last time I did in-depth research on them was probably January. Do they have a earnings date? No. 
So I need to see what's new in their marketplace. Like, how are they doing? I don't care that the stock price is going down. It's a long-term buy, um, but it's on my radar, uh, just like you. Hey, Andy, good to see you. Do you think NVIDIA will continue to grow? Yes, I know that NVIDIA technically has a high valuation right now, um, but their drive into the data center space and just simple, you know, chip shortage, uh, EV slash automated vehicles. I don't know. I mean, what's the downside for NVIDIA? Um, I don't know. But if we go historically, their forward PE of 43 is not terrible. Um, this is non-GAAP. I always get fooled on NVIDIA's uh gap because this typically yahoo does non-gap but then for some reason on nvidia they don't i don't know i just don't know how you don't like nvidia i don't own it but i have essentially a ton of exposure uh through etfs such as qqq um, i think also arc i'm guessing arc has a stake in nvidia uh to some degree all right so nvidia three days ago a lot of people came in three days ago and you see it here, you know, call it between 7 to 25% upside in the future. You got one hold. If it's long term, this is one that is going to be hard to argue over the long term. Andy says, what do you think about UA? Will they benefit? So, yeah, I mean, on airlines, it's not one that I'm playing. I'm doing the Saber, as, as Andy probably knows, because he comes by every once in a while. Uh, that's been my play. But, you know, I think the news is mostly good for airlines. I haven't been following them. Let me see what UA looks like. Oh, it's UAL, to be clear. UA is Under Armour. You know, you're inching back up. Uh, this was the time, right? These, are, these were the ideal times. But to Andy's point, it wouldn't take much to get these things going. They won't be profitable from an EPS standpoint again until next year. So that's the part that I hate. However, I happen to know, and I don't want to speak for you, Andy, but, but I happen to know through our previous conversations that you also play some momentum. And if anyone's going to have some momentum, you'd have to figure it's these guys, right? Because and momentum games play outside of some of the analysis you see uh, me have. But coming into travel season this so this used to be a $90 stock for obvious reasons it's here I could see a lot of people saying just that that um, they're buying in because this thing still has you know 40% more to go uh, and I'm guessing all of the airlines are like that five-year chart for American Southwest now Southwest I believe is profitable uh, not last year but I think from a financial standpoint, Southwest is one of the better run airlines. That was at least the old assessment on them. They're already over February 2020, which is interesting. Delta still creeping back. So United looks like the laggard as far as getting back to par. So maybe there's something there. Um if you're gonna play it, I would say get, you know. You're, you're trying to get in before the next best headline comes out about this one. Um, that's my take anyway. JP ASO, man, I know uh, ASO was like super shorted. Did that finally come out? I think we talked about this one before. If it wasn't you, JP, it was somebody else. So ASO actually has had, <laughs> I see it has jumped, uh, somewhere around here in March, it had really good fundamentals. Not that it doesn't now, but um, if you go into the analyst report on this one, uh, this company is making money. 
the problem is, is that in the short term this year, they're not looking to make a ton of money, more incremental money. And then next year's only 3%, but that's a PE of 10, right? If this ends up being $3, which is probably likely, 30 divided by three is 10. So your forward PE of 10 is a nice spot to be. So I agree it still has, technically has some juice, le juice left. What will um, hold it back until there's a different opinion about it? What will hold it back is that the growth rates are uh, single to no digits. Um, and eventually people will catch on to that. Do, do, do. What about MRK? That's from Sam Lee. Merck, a uh, drug company, not for me, but this is one of the big ones. The great thing about drug companies, before I say it, let me double check, uh, right here, 3.39% dividend on today's price, P under 30. Now, the hard thing with drug companies is unpredictable revenue. However, it looks like Merck's got solid foundation for the future. Um, you know, single digits this year could hit double digits. It's just not going to go fast, uh, mostly because the dividend will withhold some of the earnings per share. And I'm also seeing that they missed in Q4. So just make sure that that's not a ongoing problem. They probably missed right here. <laughs> uh, that's probably where that news came out. And now they're bouncing back. I don't know. I mean, with that dividend, there's worse things you can do. Merck's not going to go out of business. Uh, absolutely. Uh, for me, um, I did a little thing last week when I got the Johnson Johnson shot. By the way, I'm still alive. Um, that I thought Johnson & Johnson was um, a good drug play because they also encompass other aspects of healthcare. And when I say Johnson & Johnson, I'm looking beyond the vaccine, which I did receive, and, and I have so far no blood clots uh, coming out of my ear or anything like that. It sounds like it's for females, which is unfortunate, uh, but I think, too, if you're J&J, &J, or if you're one of these countries that it's struggling to vaccinate people, if, if they clear J&J, &J, and AstraZeneca is already clear, um, you, six people in six million have an adverse uh, side effect, and we'll likely know more about those other six people soon. I don't know how uh, a undeveloped country isn't just clamoring, like, send all that my way if you're not going to use it in the United States. Um, I'm done. Like, whatever. I got my shot. I'm done. I'm done. I'm not getting another one. And we'll see how the rest of the year plays out. Uh, I feel good. I feel blessed that I had the opportunity to get it. Um, and I think J&J &J is getting thrown through the ringer a little bit on six people out of six million. You think about my stupid um, YouTube videos, like how many uh, d down votes you get. Like I get like two or three down votes per like 40 viewers. Now, now try making a vaccine uh, that's 100% at the six million mark. It's impossible. It, it might not be blood clots, but it'll be something else. It's just impossible. All right, enough rant. Okay. Oh, OMG, Danny2, Airbnb. Love Airbnb. Want to own Airbnb. Uh, it's on more like a crash list for me at this point. Uh, just because it's like, it's not a good time to buy it uh, because everyone's doing reopening Airbnb is not quite uh, making money yet. So I think you, 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 any company that's not profitable yet, you are waiting, you're only buying dips. And that would just be my two cents. So Unity Software is one of mine that doesn't have an EPS, overvalued. I'll still buy a dip. I still believe in the company. I'll never buy it 
when it's on a five day price run, that would be the dumbest time because when you don't have earnings, you don't have support. So Airbnb doesn't have support. And so you wait for it to go down and pick it off then. Love the company though. And Danny's with me on Chamath. Dude, that guy did like sort of pump and run, man. Uh, Chamath pumped his stocks and then bounces. I, I thought that was a little lame. Um, I did not buy any of his stocks, but he came out with how many SPACs and da 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 da. And obviously they had some problems, whatever. But then he disappears. That's nuts. There's a lot of jokes out there in Twitter sphere on like he'll come back when you know they they get back going in the market, which is probably right. But he hadn't been anywhere. Short is supposed to be, oh, JP, just because I was talking about the short percentage, JP's got a note in here. It's supposed to be 144% on Clover. I don't know how true that is, but um, the stuff that I looked at didn't show that. And I use a site, look, I don't know how awesome it is, but I use a site, it's literally called, hold on. It's literally called high short interest. I'm trying to set it up so you can see it. I gotta all, turn all this crap off. Right here. See the URL or right here? Highshortinterest.com. Uh, <laughs> so this, this site's been around for a long time and it has little tabs. So like, you know, low float stocks, whatever. You get the picture, who cares? Um, when GameStop happened, that site, which is looks like a site that I would build, right, in my basement, but whoever does it updates it dutifully like three or four times a month, and GameStop short crashed it. I mean, you couldn't even get online for like two weeks. I'm sure some poor guy in his basement was like, holy shit, my site just blew up. All right, Jimmy T, Conquer 14, get out. Remove. I don't know how, this is my first official spammer, so I don't know what's going on. Um, who's next? How about... Thoughts on Tattooed Chef. I talk about them every week on these things. I'll make it brief. Tattooed Chef, um, there's risk involved. It's um, the, the biggest win for that company would be if somebody bigger bought them. So the only reason, I don't think it's necessarily a bad play. And I think, uh, generally speaking, Jeremy from Financial Education, if he talks about a stock as much as he's talked about on this, I've been watching that guy for like three years. Um, I do believe that he's done the research and I, I take his opinion. Um, I listen closely to his opinion, I guess. I don't, I don't think him and I have a lot of stocks that cross uh, together in the sense that like he recommended it and I bought it. But you know, that guy, I mean, he's a good, he's a good stock picker, I think. He deserves to be as popular as he is. But with Tattooed Chef, I'm not as excited as he is because um, I think consumer packaged goods is a very, uh, very difficult industry. And I also think that if anything with Tattooed Chef, wait till we get closer to the fall because I'm just guessing that frozen food in the summertime is a dud, uh, to put it simply. Not to mention uh, with vegetarian vegan, you have all the produce uh, is in season, right? So all the stuff that you normally maybe couldn't get, because I live in Ohio, so we actually have like seasonal vegetables and uh, fruits that you can't buy at the store, watermelon, whatever. Um, so I'm guessing it's not going to be a good quarter for Tattooed Chef in that regard. However, you know, what happens in the long term, hopefully they get bought out and, and you make a lot of money. Look for a dip, pretty simple. Do, do, do. If Coinbase is trading where it is, then PayPal needs to double. Well, 
you know, and I did that video on PayPal, uh, or excuse me, Coinbase, and I have to say that PayPal and Square are competitors. Now, they are not as good as Coinbase in the fact of offering 6 million coins, but from a stock investing perspective, I would certainly argue that PayPal and Square uh, offer um, less risk because they're not pigeonholed into crypto. Um, we'll see. I mean, I think Coinbase is a good company. I think like the IPO, since they are profitable, uh, is better than a lot of things that have come out. Just seems too expensive. Is Kai Lee, is it a good time to buy I win? I don't know. Let me clear some of these things out. I W N. Oh, Russell 2000. Um, it doesn't look like it's really been down too much. Uh, you know, the thing is with these uh, small caps, I, they're always going to be prone this year to the same volatility that we're seeing. I don't know if, um, I don't know what I think. I would say that if you're into the Russell 2000, I'm not. I would rather pick individual names at that level. I, I go the opposite way, okay? So I go smaller indexes at the top of the market, aka QQQ. So we, we do things differently, which is totally fine. And you could go on to make a lot more money than I would. I go QQQ, which is top 100 of the biggest, right? NASDAQ, you're picking... 2,000 stocks, most of which are at the bottom market cap wise of the market uh, because in theory, they have the biggest upside. Um, I think that you just close your eyes if you're a believer and you just keep buying it. And uh, you know, you're gonna need the technology, the technology revolution to continue to, um, to eke out gains there. Steel and lumber prices, uh, this is Jason. I'm gonna drink here. With steel and lumber skyrocketing, how long do you think the cycle will last? It's, this is a good question and the, I got a new, I just recorded a video before I jumped on and it's about inflation. And I'm not trying to, uh, I never pretend to be like a Yale economic professor. I, it's literally just my thoughts. Um, I, the, the, here's the flip of the coin for me. Inflation is real, it's happening now. Your, your point on lumber and steel, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see how real that is. The coin flip that we have in our world though, is it temporary or as the Fed calls it transitory or is this long-term? I kind of think it's going to be shorter term. That's where my brain goes right now. Um, and I wish I had a bunch of economic facts to tell you why I don't. In the back of my mind, all the stimulus and forbearance and all the stuff that's going on ends next year, maybe. <laughs> and things will settle back down to normal. So the topic for this weekend that'll be on the video is what are your plays on inflation? And the really hard part that I talk about, and I don't want to spoil the whole thing, um, is if you sell inflation-boosted assets, it's very, very hard to reinvest that money in something that hasn't been just as inflated, right? So selling um, your home, for example, is great in theory. And then let's just say you made hundred K there's nowhere to put that money into another home that isn't similarly inflated unless you move to a completely different region. Uh, and then you have the opportunity. So not exactly what you asked Jason, which is how long do I think it'll last? Um, I think it's in short term, uh, to be fair. How about short term being whenever we stop giving money away to everybody, so let's just call it Jan 1 of 2022. Uh, then I think that things start to come back down. 
In the short term, though, I think all of us as investors really need to like drink a beer and think about inflation and think about where the opportunities are for all of us to make a couple extra bucks because the simple rationale isn't doesn't work, right? If you sold, I don't know, guys, if you sold a painting, right, a Van Gogh or whatever you've got at your house, I don't have any of those things, um, and you and you made money and it was and it was inflated, the price was inflated because of the world we're in. Now you have cash, it's a ticking time bomb, but you need the cash, desperately need the cash to make money somewhere. You, sh- you can't go buy another painting that's inflated. That would ruin the whole reason that you sold the Van Gogh. So you have to look at different assets. Um, and that's what I think the struggle is over the short term. I really do. And I and I left some carrots in there. If you guys watch uh, the video, this will probably, I still have to edit it. So it'll probably be like Sunday. Um, but it's a lot to think about. And, and that video, by the way, is not me preaching. Uh, I try very hard not to preach. It's more like, let's think about it because it's not easy. It's not easy. I, for one, uh, let me think about this for a second. My, I live in a modest house. And I know that I could probably get 40% over what I paid in 2008-ish, something. Um, but where am I going to go? And, you know, it doesn't help. It would be great, but it doesn't help me because I'd have to buy something else even more expensive. All right. Uh, scrolling down, ELMT20. Go to ETF this month. Everything going on in the world, that's a fair question. I'm going to say IYC right now. Um, not not going to be for everybody, though, because of the expense fee. But this is consumer services. Uh, what is the expense ratio? Oh, it's not as bad as I thought. I thought it was 0.7. It's only a 0.43. But this is reopening uh multiplied and and actually now i look at it not as much reopening as consumer spending money amazon will be fine disney home depot is going to crush it this year netflix underrated stock will crush it walmart mcdonald's and if you went down to the actual like asset list you would see um all of travel in there So airlines, cruise lines, restaurant chains, IYC, uh, you know, Andy asked about the airlines earlier. There's there's a case that you you buy IYC and you just know that inflation and tourism and reopening is happening. You jump on there. Now, I love the QQQ. It's my number one ETF holding, um, but it doesn't pair very well with stocks. Uh, being expensive. But if you're buying an ETF and that you don't want to think about, I personally believe in the QQQ. So, all right, guys, I got to pause there. Um, Actually getting a ding on the phone. So it's really good to see you guys. Thanks for joining me on a Friday. A new video will come out maybe on Sunday once I'm done editing. So, Thanks to everybody for supporting the channel. I really appreciate it. We'll see you on the next live stream.